Okay, ladies and gentlemen, today the big topic is medieval European monasticism. And you're probably already thinking, what in the world is that? You're probably also thinking, what's the key question for today? The key question for today is, what is medieval European monasticism and how did it change Europe? So I'll give you a second to just write that down. What is medieval European monasticism and how did it change Europe? How did it change Europe? And you can, of course, pause this video at any time or have the sub do it or one of you do it if the sub doesn't know how. And that will be lovely. All right, so you might not recognize monasticism, but you probably recognize the word monastery. People like this live in monasteries. We call him a monk. I don't know why I chose to write that out. But monk, see, we just put a K right there. Monk. Not the detective with obsessive compulsive disorder, but instead the people who pray a lot. This is a monk. Okay, so a monastery is where a monk lives. The lifestyle that he or she lives is called a monastic lifestyle. And the practice of living as a monk is called monasticism. So that's all the lovely stuff that you need to know about that. So just some background. Now this whole thing, the idea of living as a monk and the program of living like a monk and all that other kind of good stuff was started by a guy named St. Benedict who you see pictured right here. Uh, lovely haircut and of course his halo. Um, this, he came up with the rules. He's the one who decided how you live. A bunch of people started to follow him and he decided this is how you should be. Now, a monk lives in a place called a cell. You don't need to remember that. It's not actually like a prison cell. You are allowed to leave. Uh, you see, it would make a crappy prison cell with these huge windows. But you see that it is very simple. That is a fake skull, by the way. It's just a decoration by someone who's slightly macabre. Um, you see that the decorations are quite sparse. The furniture is quite sparse. You have a table to put your uh, your glasses or whatever on, and you have a filing cabinet. And you really don't have a lot of stuff. This is part of being uh, living a monastic lifestyle. Um, so that's what you do. You pray, you take a vow of poverty, and you generally are supposed to be nice to people. Now, his sister, St. Benedict's sister, was St. Scholastica. St. Scholastica did the same thing as St. Benedict, but for these people. These, of course, are called nuns. And so the nuns are the uh, female equivalent of monks doing the same kinds of things. Charity work. Uh, praying, stuff like that. Now, these guys operate very similar, or these gals, in the case of like this person, who is obviously a female um, and a nun, uh, they provide the same kind of social services that the, uh, what are they called? No... It's so simple. The Buddhist monks, uh, they do the same kind of stuff that the Buddhist monks do. So they do monetary services. They deal with people's money, uh, just like the others. And they also provide social services like here. Uh, Margaret is an orphan or was an orphan. Now she's probably married with her own kids. I guess she'd still be an orphan. Now, monks, most people in modern society have a very low opinion of monks. They think that monks went in and made all kinds of changes to, uh, to the scriptures and whatever else and controlled the world and were some kind of secret weird society. But in actuality, monks uh, were the primary preservers of knowledge. Without monks, we would know almost nothing. 
because what they used to do, their the chief way they made money was by copying books. And what you're seeing here on the right side is one of the books that they've copied. The the most famous book that they copied is, of course, the Bible. And you see the Bible here, it's written in Latin. You see how well it's written? It looks almost typed, but it isn't. It's handwritten. And so those letters look quite perfect for what it is. I mean, this is this is just very, very well done. Um, they would also do what's called an illumination. You see the drawing here. This is Moses giving the law to the people. He's got a stone tablet here and the book which represents the law. So Moses giving the thing to the people. So they illustrated the Bible too. And they were very, very precise in doing this. Uh, the, their copies of the Bible were very, very uh, accurate. If you were very extremely, extremely rich, you could afford a copy of the Bible. It would cost the equivalent of about $40,000 in today's money. So that's a lot of money. That's a whole bunch of money. And even if you were a king, you could probably only afford a few books. In fact, the one of the largest libraries in all of Europe back then was held by a guy named Bede, the Venerable Bede, he's usually called. He was a historian, and he had about 200 books. I mean, some of you have more than that on your iPhones. But back then, that was a huge thing. So you need to know that the monks are the preservers of knowledge. Catholicism in the Middle Ages helps preserve order. And again, most people, most people don't realize that. Most people have their own kind of fictional version of this. But this is what really happened. Now, we come to feudalism. And the big question with feudalism in Europe is, did it actually exist? And the answer increasingly seems to be, no, it didn't exist. Their feudalism, remember, back to Japan, you had the emperor, and beneath the emperor were, was the shogun, and beneath him were the daimyo, right? You got a bunch of daimyo. And beneath them are the samurai, and beneath them are the serfs, right? That whole structure, we know it existed in Japan, but it actually did not exist in Europe. But for a very, very long time, about 200 years, this was such a simple explanation of European life that they just ignored all the evidence that it wasn't accurate. And so lately, they've started to challenge this. Unfortunately, the College Board is sometimes not the sharpest of the sharp, if you know what I'm saying here. And so sometimes... Uh, sometimes this still shows up on the AP test, even though scholars have pretty thoroughly debunked it. See, in real life, it just wasn't that simple. It just changed from place to place. You'll see more about that in the readings. Now, the top of the feudal organization in Europe that didn't actually exist was, of course, the king. And beneath the king, you have nobles, the nobility, and beneath the nobles, and we're going to go through each of these in turn. So don't panic if you don't get it right now. Beneath the nobles are the knights, which is spelled with a K because they used to pronounce the K. They used to say knights. Yeah. They roamed around carrying knives and did knightly things. Sounds dumb to us, but that's the way it was. And of course, at the bottom are the serfs. So we're going to look at each one of these and kind of see how they functioned. Now we'll start with the kings. And the two things you have to know about kings are that are accurate, of course, are that they had what's called the divine right of kings. Divine right means that uh, they have the right to rule that comes from God himself. Divine, right? Divine. So the king claims that God tells him to rule. Very similar to the mandate of heaven. It's the same principle, but you need to know the name of it. And of course, usually at this point, a student asks me, oh, but where does that come from in the first place? Whoever has the most swords, whoever can conquer the most people. So it's hardly really a divine right. It's like the right of the sword. The other word you've got to know is primogeniture. Primo means first. 
primary, right? First primary school. Gen, as in generation. And it sure means that to give someone something like power. Okay, so this means that power goes to the first of the generation. If you are the king, and I'm sorry, ladies, you're mostly ladies in my class, but uh, it would only go to dudes. Though, you can think of queens that were powerful, but they come later. And we'll talk about them, and some of them are pretty awesome. But for now, we've got a king, and he's a dude. Now, let's say he has three sons. One, two, and three. He, he's not very creative with his naming scheme here. So, uh, the king will give the kingdom to his first son. It just goes there. That's what primogeniture says. Goes to the first son. Oh, but what if the first son is dead? Well, then the first son is not available, so it goes to the second son. Oh, but what if there's a daughter right here? Doesn't matter, they skip her because they're sexist in the past, and so it would go, if he's dead, it would go to him. Oh, but what if they're all dead, or what if he has only girls? Then it goes to his brother. His brother becomes the new king. Oh, but what if they go back until they find somebody, okay? It goes to the oldest son, and there is a case that we'll talk about later where it ends up being like the king's fourth cousin. Which would be cool. So maybe one of you someday will be king. Although not of England. They know who their person is. Now the nobles work under the direction of the king. And they, they owned a big amount of space like this. They would live in the manor. They live in the manor house. Um, and then they would own essentially the entire village. And we're not going to worry about how they do the three field system here. But the serfs would all be required to work for him. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But suffice it to say that for now, he owns the land. The nobles work under the king's direction. The loyalty, loyalty to the king is rewarded with titles and lands. Now, the Knights. You do not need to know all this stuff. It just looked really cool and everything. How knights work. This really, this illustration has nothing to do with it except that it shows all this stuff. The real way knights work, knights, in popular imagination, the knights go in and they rescue the damsel in distress. But in real life, the knight's job is just like the job of the samurai. It's not his job to save the damsel from distress, it's his job to put the damsel into distress. So the knight would come over into some neighboring village and rough up all the locals there. Oh no, oh, it's the knights. Ah. And then uh, try to force them to go under the subjugation of a different noble, of the noble that the knight's in charge of, or the noble that the knight works for. Uh, and of course, the knights over here try to protect themselves from the other knights or try to protect the villagers from the other knights. So this is this is why the Middle Ages gets a reputation for, as a fairly violent time, because this keeps going on. But in actuality, the knights really help protect the serfs. Um, well, I should say they help protect their serfs. The enemy serfs, they're just in trouble. Of course, the knights will also go and fight for the nobles if the king demands it. But so will a bunch of the serfs. Now, bottom, last but not least, is the serf, the peasants. Peasants were usually serfs. And we have, again, this kind of popular idea that the noble stands over the serfs and makes them work. Look how sad this man looks. He's being forced to work by the noble. Oh dear. But in reality, the peasants actually had quite a few rights. They had quite a few freedoms. The, the, uh, um, the nobles were not allowed to push them too far. Now, they had to work, but they weren't really slaves. Instead, they were kind of taxed for their protection, and that tax is called the corvée. Uh, what the corvée means is that 
the serfs have to give so much work to the noble. And it's usually two or three days a week during harvest time. So you, you go in, you're, you're a serf, you work your own fields most of the time, but then twice a week you go in and you work the lord's fields. The lord or the earl or the baron or whoever, whatever noble, you work his fields. Uh, but those two days that you have to work, once again, it's called the corvée. Those days you work for the noble. It's a tax on your labor. And in exchange, their knights protect you from the enemy knights. Um, who enforces this? Who, who makes sure that they don't push the peasants too far? The church. Because when they threaten everybody's salvation, they can convince them to toe the line a little bit. And so the other thing is the peasants, if the nobles pushed them too far, the peasants could uh, kind of encourage enemy knights to come in. And so it worked. It worked fairly well. And that's that's the corvée and that's serfs. These poor peasants. Yes, and everything is lovely. Now, if you need to see this again, this is on YouTube. And I've written the URL on the board. So if you miss something, don't panic. Just go and get the notes again. I apologize. I forgot that I had a meeting this afternoon and I wasn't going to be here. We will do the uh whatever it's called the viking simulation tomorrow now with whatever time is left what i'd like you to do is go over your notes with the people sitting next to you see if you missed anything that they got and if if you finish that please take the time to study if you screw around i will be unhappy and if i'm unhappy i'll make sure that you end up unhappy too. So be good. Be good. And I'll see you tomorrow. That was loud. Sorry.